And it's one o'clock on Tuesday, February the 1st, and you must be watching Science at Soast. I'm your host, Pete McGinnis Mark. And for those of you watching the show in Hawaii, Gong Hee Fat Choi, it's Chinese New Year, no less. <laughs> This particular show is all about presenting research topics from the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology, that's SOST, here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And the whole objective of the course is to basically show what the students are doing in terms of their research, and hopefully we're getting a great diversity of topics. Last week, we heard about ocean color, and today uh, our guest, Marley Chukov, is going to be telling us all about the regolith, or the soil, on, on the moon. So, Marley, welcome. It's great to have you here, and uh, we're really interested in some lunar studies. But first off, just tell us a little bit about yourself. You're a graduate student, as I understand. Yeah. Uh, I'm Marley Chertok. I'm a second year graduate student. I work with uh, Paul Lucy here at uh, Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. Okay, and uh, you are doing a, a PhD, and I understand that um, you're sort of just starting to put together research topics. All students have to uh, get through comprehensive exams, and then they can focus in on research. And your particular area of research is on the moon. Uh, and in particular, you're talking about something called the regolith. And that's the theme of today's program. So Marley, um, where should we start? Uh, I think probably the first slide might be a good introduction. So um, Michael, if we can see the first slide, tell us a little bit, why, why are we seeing uh, both the ancient moon on the left-hand side and today's moon on the right-hand side. Yeah, absolutely. So something I'd like to sort of go into before we start is that the lunar soil is not like the soil we have here on Earth. The soil on Earth is sort of formed by erosional processes like wind and water, but the lunar regolith is different. Um, the moon is an airless body, meaning it has no atmosphere. And so uh, the regolith develops rather differently there. Um, rego means blanket and lith means rock. So um, it's not acting like the soils we have here where there's like layers of organics and horizons, um, very much get like this fine powdery substance at the surface. So what we're looking at here is um, ancient lunar um, uh, eruptions on the moon. And what happens is these eruptions get buried by regolith. Um, and so actually we're not able to see these mare basalts, um, which is the dark parts of the moon that we see on the right and the moon today. Those are all covered by regolith. And of course the, the image on the left is an artist's rendition. Um, when we're thinking about the ancient moon, um, that's way before uh, people were on earth or even the dinosaurs, right? We're looking way back early in the formation of the solar system would be my guess. Yeah, absolutely. So. The moon formed about four and a half billion years ago. And so what we're seeing in that image is this like notion of late stage volcanism on the moon that occurred between four billion years ago and had a flux until about three billion years ago. And then, um, but there's been some volcanism since about, uh, until about one billion years ago at this point. And that's billion with a B. Uh, <laughs> and I understand that you know, uh, on earth, Hawaii, of course, um, Kauai is only 5 million years old, and probably the ancient continents on Earth are perhaps less than half the age of this ancient volcanism on the moon. So that we're looking really far back in time, correct? Right, exactly. We're looking really far back in time. The regolith shields these things. So I think scientists sometimes find it a little annoying because you can't really see below it. Um, but the regolith is sort of this fantastic timekeeper. It doesn't really keep track of time in a constant way. It sort of keeps track of time in terms of the energy of the solar system. So um, there was an impact flux billions of years ago at this point, and there's still one, but it's less so. So the regolith develops because meteorites bombard the surface and grind things up, kind of like a mortar and pestle. Um, and it, it grows the regolith. The, the impact Sorry. flux you're talking about, is uh, the, the number of projectiles, you know, comets or asteroids that happen to hit the surface of the moon in any given unit of time. Right, exactly. And the moon has 
seen four and a half billion years of the solar system's history. Um, and it's preserved in these impactors. Um, so the regolith is developing as these impacts hit the surface and grind things up and mix it and build it up. Um, but what's really interesting is that the regolith is sensitive to the energy of the universe. So when there were more impactors, when the solar system was young, the regolith developed really quickly. Um, but now it's developing quite slowly. Okay, and in the right hand image of that first slide, um, we're looking at the near side of the moon. Um, the, the dark areas you said are young ish volcanic flows, and right, got yeah. the lighter lunar highlands, and then those little pinpoints with sort of rays coming out from them. That's presumably an example of the meteorite impacts that you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Um, some of these mare units, the dark parts of the moon, you can see they're pretty circular. So there's some huge impacts and uh, mare lavas infill these basins. Um, and uh, uh, it does an excellent job of preserving this. So these raid craters that you were pointing out are actually sampled, like these impacts are sampling below the subsurface and exposing rocks at the surface. And they're of all different sizes, right? If that big circular dark patch, which I believe is Mari Imbium, uh, it is over a thousand miles across, some of the uh, bigger things you can see from Earth might still be tens of miles across and they go really down to small sizes. Right. Yeah. So, um, there's some huge impacts that happened a very long time ago at this point. We really only see these smaller ones at this point. Yeah. Um, but the, the moon does an excellent job of recording these impacts. Like on earth, for example, we have a lot of erosional processes and plate tectonics and it wipes the surface clean every so often. So the moon is a super great uh, natural laboratory for studying cratering. And I believe um, in the next slide, you've got an example. We've actually seen um, just how thick perhaps this lunar regolith can be. If we go on to the second slide, um, talk us through what we're seeing here, Marley. Yeah, so this is the Apollo 15 landing site at Hadley Real. Um, and what you're seeing on the left is an astronaut who is at the site, probably taking measurements. But on the right, you're seeing these mare lava flow deposits. And on top of those deposits um, are, is the regolith that's been developing since its emplacement or since it's flowed and cooled. Okay, and, and for further detail, I think in the left-hand slide, that little rectangular black box shows where um, the more detailed uh, image uh, was taken. And so um, what we're looking at, it looks like a river valley, but you just said the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So what exactly is uh, the astronaut standing in front of? Uh, I think it's a crater, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, oh, okay. Well, I, I thought you knew it's Hadley Will. <laughs> oh, oh, right. oh, yeah. Okay. So I, I know you're taking a course in lunar volcanism, so maybe you've not seen that already. But yes, you, you're seeing the age of a, a, one, what was once a very active lava channel. So uh, that, right. that's, that's the idea. And it's about uh, uh, 700 meters across and 300 meters deep, I think, at that stage. But yeah. Uh, so that gives us a really good understanding that this layer of fragmented rock or regolith has built up over an extended period of time. Um, maybe you can just uh, help us better understand how does the, the rock get broken up? There, there's a particular sequence of events during a, a meteorite impact, isn't there? Right, exactly. So um, uh, an impactor strikes the moon, Maybe and we it go develops... to the next slide, please. That would we can go. There we go. All right. And there it's we go. Perfect. One through six. All right. So right. what are we seeing here? Yeah, so we're seeing an impactor strike the lunar surface and it's excavating material. That excavated material is super interesting for what we want to understand about the lunar subsurface. Impactors have this super unique ability where they are able to sample below the regolith and excavate material that we wouldn't otherwise see 
onto its ejecta blanket. So if you follow the um, one, two, three, four, five, up until six, you'll see this purple on the edge of the crater, and that's the ejecta blanket. And it contains really interesting information about the lava flows that were once under the, that are under the regolith now. Okay, and, and of course, um, you know, students can take whole courses in impact cratering mechanics, as it's called. Um, any idea how fast these projectiles are hitting the surface of the moon or um, you know, what their um, main processes are with them? You may not have taken classes yet on this. So I'm just interested to know. Uh, I mean, at this point, I think it's kilometers per second, uh, really high velocity impacts. Um, the way I like to think about things that end up in the ejecta blanket is if I was a great pitcher, which I'm not, I could throw a rock at a parking lot surface. And let's say the parking lot is gravel. It's going to break up the rock and eject it onto the blanket pretty onto the impact blanket pretty well. But if it was like a asphalt surface and I was also a great pitcher and I, I was throwing this rock at the surface, it might just like crack it up a little bit. And so what we see in the ejecta blanket is highly dependent on the strength of the subsurface. Okay, I see. So um, which type of material would be thrown further if it hits a solid surface or if it hits a, a very fine dusty surface? Well, any ideas? Yeah, so I think if it's more unconsolidated, like that gravelly surface I was talking about, I think things would um, be flown further, but also I think there'd be just more rocks in the ejecta blanket. But if we were striking something more competent, something that um, like the asphalt parking lot, it would be much harder to break up and eject rocks. The impact would have to have a lot of energy. Uh, and we saw uh, uh, on that uh, original slide that the ejecta from some of these craters may extend you know, tens or hundreds of kilometers away from the parent crater. So this ejector blanket that you're talking about, which is helping to form the regolith, isn't just right by the crater rim. It goes right. way, way, way out, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, right, so yeah, how do you... Sorry, go ahead. In that first image we were seeing, we saw, I think that was Tycho, which is super bright arrayed. And it, it, I mean, it, it extends latitudes north and south. So um, it's we usually we see craters that sort of have a more con confined ejecta blanket, but this one is quite big. Yeah. And, and Tycho is quite a young crater by lunar standards, so it's fairly well preserved. Now, right. how do you study um, the regolith? Uh, you know, Jim in Apollo 15 could actually walk up and touch it. Um, but a graduate student in her studies, you know, do, do you do laboratory work, computer simulations? How do you study the regular? Yeah, so here on Earth, it's really easy. <laughs> um, we see young lava flows, such as those on the Big Island, and we can look at those using satellite imagery a lot of the times, or aerial imagery. Um, but for the older flows, we can just walk right up to them and, um, and easily access them, collect samples. But we really only have like six data sets in, in, in some ways to work with, six Apollo landing sites. Um, and so we're really confined by the fact that we don't have a lot of what we call ground truth data. Um, what I use is aerial imagery. I use the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which I think is one of the slides I have. Yes, uh, um, the next the slide number four. There we go. All right. So, yeah. so tell us, uh, it, it says it's NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and there's two arrows. Um, yeah. Can you explain to us what the arrows point to? Yeah, absolutely. So NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter launched in, I think, 2009, um, and it's been orbiting the moon. It does great things. Um, I used the camera called LROC, um, and I use that to count craters. And so that's how I identify my craters. Um, and then there's another instrument on there that is a um, thermal imaging imager. So it uses, um, it's called Diviner. And so what we do with Diviner is it makes thermal measurements of the surface and it's actually able to detect rocks super well. Um, rocks retain their heat into the lunar night um, better than the regolith that surrounds it. So we can really easily identify these rocks versus these um, soils and um, uh, uh, constrain them and figure out how many rocks there are in a given pixel. 
I, I always hear, hear the analogy that it's like you, you've got some coals in a barbecue and you, you heat up the barbecue and then if you try and take the coals out they take an awful long time to cool down is, is that the equivalent of what you're telling us that divine yeah. can measure okay yeah absolutely and, and is it measuring the heat or the color or, or, or what where where do you get the information about how hot the rock is it's measuring the heat. And so actually what it's measuring is the, in some ways, the thermal inertia of the rock. So how well the rock retains its heat. And so it's able to make those measurements um, and tell me how many, for example, how many rocks there are per pixel. Right. And here we've got on, on the next slide, I think um, we've got what looks like a, um, a, a, a garishly colored image with a crater in the middle. And then there's some images on the right hand side. Explain yeah. to the viewers what exactly we're looking at here. Yeah, so this is a, um, a very rocky crater. And so this is uh, the rock abundance data set that is overlain on top of a, the cam basically the camera's data set. And so what we're seeing is what Diviner sees. So Diviner. I'm able to find these anomalously rocky craters using Diviner and I, I overlay these garish colors on top of the craters. And um, I look at the ejecta blankets. And so what it's showing is that Diviner accurately shows us that there are rocks in the ejecta when it says it has a high rock abundance value. Okay. Uh, and um, viewers might just be able to see on the right hand image that detailed L rock picture of the, the moon. Um, there, there are some little blocks there. Um, roughly, how large would one of those rocks be? Um, if you can see it in the image, is it you know, a few inches or is it a couple of feet or 10 feet? Do you know? It's probably a couple of meters. Um, probably a couple of so feet. That's six, six to eight feet, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, okay. Literally, cool. Um, so if you've got this, you're developing this technique to find where the rocks are on the moon, that could be quite useful in the future. I'm thinking, is it um, going to be useful where astronauts might land on the surface? We're sending astronauts to the moon, say, in 2025 or 26. These boulders are big enough, they might actually affect some of the, the landing sites, wouldn't they? That's absolutely true. And so Diviner helps us choose these landing sites. We don't want to <laughs> land in a boulder field. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not a good idea. Even the no. Armstrong didn't do that with Apollo 11. So um, right. is, is part of your research then geared towards you know, the, these future missions to the moon? Or is that a potential career development for you? Well, I, I hope so. I mean, I would love to be a part of a mission in any way I can be eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, these types of data sets would be really helpful. And also, um, create, like when, when you're looking at rock abundance, you want to pick some pick a location that is super interesting. And so when there's rocks in the ejecta, actually you might want to land sort of close by, but not in the boulder field. So you can collect mm -hmm. actual rocks. Otherwise, you're just on top of regolith and then you're just looking at the fine grain stuff. Okay. And an immediate question in my mind would be, so does all of the moon look the same or do you find different areas with different rock abundances? Yeah, so part of my interest is in um, uh, sensing different types of lava flows on the moon. And so we can do this by looking at the rock abundance in the ejecta and we're sort of trying to confine this mechanical strength of what's going on with these um, lava flows that are lie beneath the regolith. Um, and so what we're seeing, um, and we have our final slide for that, um, is there's a huge difference between like Mare Humorum, which is super rocky. You can see that has a lot of those um, garishly covered, colored um, craters and then Mare Nectaris, which is uh, super barely rocky. So- And each one of those images that there's a scale bar in the bottom right so that's about 30 miles or 50 kilometers and they generally look blue and if i yeah. remember 
the previous slide, blue means no rocks. Right, exactly. Blue means and then, no rocks. <laughs> yeah, and then yellow and red means lots of rocks. Okay, so why why do these two parts of the moon, which are both ancient lava flows, why do they look different? Yeah, so that's what we're trying to, to understand. And um, we have some ideas. So for example, Mari Humorum, which is much rockier, let's compare it to that gravel parking lot that we talked about earlier. So maybe it's more unconsolidated. Maybe there were a lot of bubbles in the flow and it's really foamy. So impactors don't have to spend a lot of energy breaking up the rock to then eject it because it's already quite weak. Um, and then maybe Mari Nectaris is super confident. And so, um, we're striking that asphalt parking lot where it's really hard to eject rock. Um, but there's also something else that we need to consider and that's the thickness of the regolith. Um, if impactors can't actually reach the bottom of the regolith, then they won't eject rocks. But in the Mare regions, we're pretty well, can, um, uh, impactors can almost always excavate rocks, especially the, more la the larger ones because the regolith is only about two meters or I think that's the height of a basketball player to like right. five meters, which is the height of a giraffe. <laughs> now, now I understand offline, you've told me that you're doing some computer modeling of lava flows. Is that intended to sort of understand how they might break up if hit by a projectile or, or where's that research taking you? Yeah, so if we can't exactly see the differences from the surface of these lava flows, maybe we can actually just confine their strengths. And so something I'm going to work on is modeling these types of things, like how does a foamy flow react to um, impact versus something that is more like poi hoi, so like really competent and um, uh, doesn't have a lot of cracks and vesicles. All right, so so. Um, that, that's an aspect of your research coming up in the next few years. Where, where do you see this particular type of investigation going? And, you know, is uh, uh, UH Manoa a good place to do this kind of work? You know, so as a graduate student, hopefully you're hoping to graduate soon uh, and get a job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> are we training you well or, or what, what's your impression? Absolutely. I, as much as I love it here, I don't want to stay here forever. I want to <laughs> get out into the workforce. Um, yeah, so I, um, I, there's a lot of great mentorship opportunities here. It's something that I've really taken advantage of. We have excellent postdoc, Emily Costello, who's been wow. an excellent mentor to me, and she studies uh, the regolith mixing model, and she looks at the development of the regolith on the moon. We also have Shui Li, who um, works on constraining volatiles on the moon. And so there's so many different things happening at SOAS. So I have a lot of, it's not difficult to find a mentor, I would say. <laughs> and your advisors, Dr. Paul Lucy, right? Who right. Re recently won the Carl Sagan Young Investigator or something like that from NASA. So uh, it sounds like you're in good hands. And so um, future jobs, what, what kind of, Thing would you be interested in if you move to the mainland or uh, go international? What what what's the goal? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for me, first things first, and that's to get a postdoc when I'm done. Um, okay. <laughs> so postdoc, and then I I really hope to work on a mission in some capacity, and so I hope that this research will propel me into that. Okay. And are there new missions coming along? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of exciting yeah. things. Um, there's okay. Viper, which is going to the lunar poles, and it should be should be really interesting. Oh, oh, and, and I know offline there are other faculty members at UH are proposing to go to other parts of the moon um, with robotic explorers. And of course, the astronauts will probably go to the south pole of the moon, uh, perhaps in four or five years' time. So that sounds really quite exciting. Um, would you have to work for NASA or university or are there commercial firms you might be looking at as job opportunities? Absolutely. Yeah, there's some commercial options out there. Um, uh, I, I would just be excited to be a part of anything at some point. So I think that it would be good yeah. to get that experience. Yeah, for my own uh, background. You know, companies like uh, Blue Origin and SpaceX are going to be sending their own 
landers to the moon uh, in the next two or three years, for example. I mean, it sounds like if someone like yourself can tell them that, uh, hey, you know, this is an area which is relatively boulder free, then it's safe to land. So um, that's a, that's the sort of thing which uh, might be really valuable. So it's good to hear that UH is actually training you uh, in an exciting field that uh, uh, may indeed uh, provide a, a job for you, which is good. Absolutely, yeah. Good. Well, um, anything else that you'd like to tell us? Uh, you, you're doing um, this computer modeling. You're doing uh, working with Diviner. Um, you know, what classes do you have to take in order to learn about this research? Yeah. So last semester I took a lava flow and rheology class, and this semester I'm taking a lunar volcanism class. So um, I'm really immersing myself into this volcanology aspect um, that. Um, uh, I, I'm hoping will take me quite far. So I, I, my degree, I have a bachelor's in geology. So um, I have a strong background in rocks, but I don't exactly know how they work on planets, on other planets. So I think that um, being here has been really uh, instrumental towards my development as a scientist. And, and I know there are problems with COVID during inter-island travel, but have you been to the big island to see the current eruption? I have actually, yeah. So um, we were on the Big Island in October for my lava flow rheology class, and we got to see the lava lake. It was really incredible. And, and can you actually tell the professor or the other students, hey, you, um, this is what you would expect to see on the moon with the same kind of uh, geologic processes? I presume Hawaii is a good analog to the moon, but I should ask you if you think that's the case. It absolutely is. I mean, there's so many different um, volcanic features on Earth and um, different types of volcanism on the Big Island alone. So there has to be lots of different things that are happening on the moon as well. Mm -hmm. It's just on the Big Island, presumably it's a lot younger. But, uh, well, Molly, right. uh, we're almost <laughs> out of time. Uh, I want to thank you again. Uh, I know it's a challenge for any graduate student to come on the show and get quizzed by a professor. <laughs> um, but it's really been interesting to hear about your studies of the uh, lunar regolith, uh, as well as some aspects of volcanism on the moon. So thank you again for being willing to come on the show. Let me just remind the audience, you have been watching uh, Think Tech Hawaii's Science at SOST. I've been your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and please join us again next week where we'll have some other uh, interesting aspect of research being conducted at UHNOAA. So until then, goodbye for now. Mm -hmm.